Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you today. I'm, uh, my name is Stéphane Jaillet. I'm the CEO of OpenSphere. And um, again, I'm happy to, very glad to, to be here. I'm happy to be here with you for this fourth session of the, our webinar series. Uh, let me introduce you to someone that you should be familiar with now. For those who have attended our previous sessions, welcome on board, Martin. You are the CTO of uh, Enclose, and today you'll be the main speaker of this session. How are you today, Martin? Good, good. I'm very well. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thanks for having me uh, today on the webinar. Glad to be here too. So, uh, before starting, uh, let me tell us. Let me tell you, sorry, a few words about uh, our companies, uh, OpenSphere and and the Enclose are uh, similar companies. We both have been providing cybersecurity services for uh, more than 13 years now. And uh, we have been working together for the last three years now, mainly for audits, vulnerability assessments, penetration testing. And now we want to expand uh, our collaboration around the uh, SOC and the uh, MDR services. Uh, aiming at providing a 24-7 service in the Indian Ocean, uh, sharing uh, and putting together our tools, our teams, and uh, our expect expertise. Um, at the beginning of this year, we decided to make this uh, webinar series talking about cyber defense. In the first session, we discussed a uh, difference between uh, CM, SOC, and the MDR and um, trying to explain why traditional SOC is failing due to alert fatigue, for example, and uh, also due to the fact that uh, the, the SOC is uh, mainly relying on a SIM, uh, which is a tool to, which has to be very uh, well parametered, and that's uh, sometimes not the case. During the second session, we uh, talked about defense because we uh, always hear about cyber attacks, but uh, defense is actually a very interesting domain too. For example, we, we see pen testers uh, often become defense people after a while because uh, they find it very challenging too. And um, we also discussed about the DNS which is also a good way to, to, to defend the information system against attack. Uh, the third uh, panel, the third session was a panel discussion talking about uh, red team and uh, blue team versus blue team and also how the CISO could use both, team, both teams in order to have the better uh, risk coverage uh, in, the, in, the, in his system. So, uh, during the, the, three, the first three sessions, we had many questions, and sometimes we had questions about AI and behavioral analysis provided by uh, some team and uh, vendors. And um, today, Martin will uh, share with us the fact that maybe uh, even if the vendors are saying the contrary, uh, maybe signature detection is not dead. So to you, uh, Martin, uh, cool. give you give you the control. Cool. Thanks Here is it. That. Thanks for that introduction. Let me just get my screen up. Yeah. I just need uh, permission to share quickly. Yeah. No problem. Um, also, I wanted to add that uh, you can. Um, you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, don't be shy, and uh, we will answer the questions at the end of the of the session. So feel free to ask questions. Um, uh, okay, I can see. I can the, see your, see your the zombies. Yeah, the zombie. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I thought uh, this would be a fitting uh, photo because uh, because of the you know everyone's saying uh, that signature detection is dead. Um, so uh, I'm just going to give you maybe a little bit uh, before we kick off, or just give you a little bit more background of, about myself. Um, 
So I'm a techie at heart. Uh, you know, I started my career uh, doing technical things in 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 ISP, and uh, that's where it, it grew from. Uh, as Stefan mentioned, uh, we co-founded uh, Enclose in 2006. And yeah, I've given me over, you know, almost 20 years of experience in cybersecurity. Um, in the past five years, I've been in the process of uh, building our MDR service, which uh, Stefan touched on initially, which is essentially a managed SOC service uh, that we offer to uh, customers uh, in the southern part of, well, actually around the globe at the moment. So we've got customers all around the world. Um, yeah, there's my email. Feel free to contact me. Uh, and there's uh, my Twitter account. Uh, I'm not very active on Twitter, but um, I do post every now and again. Um, so before we kick off, well, to kick off, let's kind of define what is signature detection. Uh, and there's different different definitions of it, but I think this, you know, I looked around and this was a, a good de a definition of what signature uh, based detection is. And it refers to the de detection of attacks, or you could say malicious activity by looking at specific patterns. Um, and if you want to be, you know, if you want to dig down into the patterns or what you're looking at, you're looking at byte sequences. So um, network traffic. Uh, so it's not necessarily just a program. It could be network traffic um, or instructions. Uh, you, inside a script, et cetera. Uh, and that's really what um, I think a good definition of what signature detection is. And it's, it's not a new thing. It's been around for literally as long as security has been around. And so how does signature detection work? Um, well, so, you know, the, there's a process of, of how it gets integrated into our products. Uh, and if you look at it, you know, first, Someone needs to see the suspicious uh, software or, or code or something that that's malicious. Um, you know, it needs to be seen by someone first, uh, and then if we find it, we we can submit it to the the AV vendors. And in this process here, I'm specifically talking about antivirus signatures, um, but the same process applies to kind of IPS signatures, etc. Uh, so once we see this, the suspicious code, then we submit that code to the, to the vendors. Uh, the vendors uh, verify that it is actually malicious, and then they write a signature for it so that they can find it in, in different places. And then once that signature is uh, written, then it needs to get distributed back to the network of AV installations. Um, uh, and then once it's distributed, then uh, it gets applied. And so the distribution comes from the AV vendor and it goes to your AV console and then to the actual endpoints. So it's quite a quite a process to get this uh, to get this working in an environment. And you can understand that there's some delay from the time that you see the code, uh, the suspicious code, to the time that it can be distributed to literally around the world. Um, to be able to pick up that malicious, that same malicious activity. And that delay is typically days, um, sometimes weeks. And so obviously we've, we've um, that delay is a big problem. And so we've tried to fix that. And how, that, how we fix that is we've kind of combined some of these things and automated them. So the first three parts have been automated in terms of, uh, you know, sandboxing. So, what happened initially was the AV vendors just put this um, malicious code into a sandbox in their environment, and then it spit out a signature. And what they did then is they put that sandbox in the client's environment in some cases. So that really speeds the process up in terms of generating that signature. And then also the distrib distribution uh, has also been sped up uh, by making it accessible directly in the cloud. So instead of uh, sending that signature to get into the AV vendor and then back out, it's just available in the cloud. And then we check in automatically into the cloud to update our, uh, to get the signatures or even just to check uh, via hashes directly the files. And ultimately, a lot of this technology can now move on site. So the signatures can be almost uh, instantaneously. As soon as we have fine malicious code, we can, you know, the systems are available now that can just automatically have the signature detected uh, or signature available in your environment as soon as you see the suspicious code. 
so there definitely has been some sort of uh, improvement on how signatures uh, or some efficiency improvements in terms of how they get generated and, and distributed. So that's helped a bit, but there was still the reliance on us having to see the bad code. Um, and when I put this together, I, I, th I thought that this is actually very similar to how threat intelligence works. Um, so uh, I'm specifically talking about threat feeds in terms of indicators of compromise, so like bad IP addresses, et cetera, or suspicious uh, phishing mails works in the same way. We see the, uh, we see the suspicious IOC, like an IP address that's behaving badly. Uh, that gets submitted to the threat intelligence uh, vendor. Uh, the vendor validates it, and then it gets distributed. So kind of uh, IO, IOC feeds can also be considered a, a kind of signature-based type detection, and it's still something that's used quite a bit. Um, and I thought that it was important to make that connection, uh, and we'll chat about that a little bit later as well. Um, okay, so we know how it works. Um, why is it bad? So I mentioned the delay, but if you look at the if you look at the the, the headlines, um, you know you just read bad things about signature detection. You know, it's, you know some of the headlines here: signature is, is no signature based defense is no longer adequate. People talk about the limitations of signature based security. Uh, and then they talk about things that you should do, like using behavioral analytics. Um, so, you know, what is what is the crux of it? Why is it, why does it have a bad rap? And it kind of talks to one of the first points that I mentioned in that in that flow. And it is one of the biggest limiting factors beyond signatures is that these are always reactive in nature. So we first have to see the bad uh, code before we can write a signature for it. Um, and that appears to be a very reactive way of doing things. You know, in security, we, we try to be more proactive and, and stop attacks uh, before they get to the point where they're actually doing it. And, and the whole concept around signatures is we have to see it happen first before we can stop it. So it's, it sounds like a reasonable argument. Um, So, okay, so let's say signature detections are not good, right? So, how, you know, what are, what, are, what are people suggesting that we do to actually detect uh, malicious behavior um, or malicious activity? And a lot of what we're reading is talking about behavioral detection using analysis, analysis right? And it sounds, it sounds a lot more interesting than signature detection. It sounds, intel it sounds intelligent and... Uh, in many in many cases, you'll hear machine learning or artificial intelligence um, being thrown around with behavioral detection. There's, uh, you know, I think they call it Yuba, or there's different ways of, of referring to this, but they all talk about, it's pretty much talking about the same kind of concept that we're, we're picking up behavior, right? So what does that actually mean? What is, let's just kind of dig into that because, you know, we, we often hear the vendors talking uh, about th certain things, but we, it, it's important that we understand what it actually means um, because we want to wade through the, the marketing speak and actually look at what it means, right? So what is behavioral an analytics? And, and so we, I looked at some, some definitions of this and I, th I thought this was a good one and they all seem to kind of, this was a, a good one that sums up what I found was available on the internet. So, you know, it's a, uh, behavioral analytics solutions look at patterns of human behavior, right? And then they specifically use human behavior in the, in the terminology, obviously. Uh, and then apply algorithms and statistical analysis to detect meaningful, meaningful anomalies from those patterns, right? Uh, and those, those anomalies uh, often indicate uh, potential threats. So if we look at signature-based detection and we look at behavioral analytics, they're still both looking at patterns, right? So that was an interesting uh, resemblance of the two. Um, so if we want to, if we want to go beyond that, so we we're, we're both looking at patterns. Um, now how is how are they different then? Um, there must be some other things that make them different. Um, so let's look at the behavioral part. How does behavioral detection look? Because this is now the other thing is looking at code. Now we're looking at behavioral detection. And how do we, you know, how do we, how do we do that? How do we look at someone's behavior 
uh, it sounds like, you know, um, it sounds like a difficult thing to do. You know, you can't have a camera on the person and, and see what they're doing. That doesn't make sense. Uh, how do we how do we understand what they're doing in their behavior? Uh, and let's let's see what some of the the vendors are telling us. They they're using artificial intelligence, right? And I think the the point of the slide is that we we can't just accept what the vendors are telling us that it's artificial intelligence. Uh, because uh, it's a very contentious topic, artificial intelligence. Um, and I think if you speak to any of the scientists that are professionals or that are, you know, experienced in artificial intelligence, uh, you'll understand that we're very far away from actually doing, you know, from artificial intelligence, just understanding behavior. We need to look into this a little bit deeper to understand what we're actually saying here. So really don't, you know, let's, get out of let's get these fancy terms out of the way and let's look at how do we actually detect behavior because that's what they're saying we're detecting behavior uh, so let's go through the process of how these systems work so a user takes some action that could be opening a file it could be logging onto a website it could be um, you know launching an application um, and then some telemetry is created so all those actions create uh, some type of log file or some type of data uh, of a, a, a kind of trace of what is going on, an audit, an audit trail of what's actually happening. Uh, and then the solution, this is where the solution starts looking at those patterns. Um, so it's looking for patterns in that telemetry. And then here comes the magic part where we start throwing AI into the, into the mix, right? And then the detection is triggered, right? So, so the first part is pretty straightforward, right? We're just getting log files or we're getting data from, a, from whatever. It could be the endpoint. It could be from different sources. And we're looking for patterns. But this whole AI part is the tricky part. You know, this sounds like it's very complex. So let's look at that particular component uh, in a little bit more detail so that we can see what that actually means. And it sounds it sounds complex, but we don't actually need uh, we don't actually need complex analysis for that. Uh, in in well, in most cases we don't. So I I, I think I like to use a, a couple of examples here, and um, I think the the main point is that malicious activity doesn't normally emanate normal user activity. So when something malicious is happening, uh, it doesn't it doesn't look like normal activity. So why do we need very complex analysis or artificial intelligence to, to do that, uh, to identify that? And my argument, I guess, here is that we don't actually need very complex ways. And there's two ways to skin a cat in those cases. You know, we can apply very complex artificial intelligence, um, but in most cases, we don't have to do that. So, you know, it just adds... Um, it just adds problems into the link in terms of detecting that malicious activity. Um, and, you know, if you can look at some examples uh, of, if you look at any type of malicious activity, uh, if you can look at, for instance, a ransomware infection, which is quite a basic thing. It happens a lot. Um, if you look at that activity, um, you don't need complex analysis to understand that that's outside of what the user normally does. It's simple. You know, the, there's a process that spawns up and it's, you know, it's accessing all the files in a directory or on your system and it's changing every file. You know, there's not many applications that do that. So, you know, there's nothing really complex about looking and identifying ransomware. Um, I know I've simplified it a little bit, but I think for the purpose of, of you know, giving an example, I think it's, it's quite valid. So if we take the complexity out of it and, I am saying we can take the complexity out of, of that detection, uh, you know, behavioral detection. Um, what happens when we, when we take it out? Uh, it just starts looking like normal signature detection. So uh, I think this is the crux of the matter. This is just, we're actually just looking at normal signature detection and the AI is, is kind of just marketing speak in terms of uh, the vendors trying to get us to believe that the solution that they're selling is, is needed to be able to detect this uh, type of activity. Um, 
Yeah, so I suspect that some vendors may disagree with me on that. Um, but I think it's certainly something that needs to be debated in that. And I encourage everyone to, you know, if they if they have a, someone coming to them talking about artificial intelligence, uh, don't be scared to ask them, okay, tell me about this artificial intelligence, you know, uh, and be cautious uh, about some of the terms. Um, you know, they might start throwing uh, neural networks, machine learning, and all those terms around to, to scare us off. Um, but don't let that uh, detract you from asking those tough questions, because you'll find in many cases that as soon as you start asking those uh, tough questions, that uh, the vendor is going to crawl back under a rock and, and not be able to answer those or refer to a higher power in the organization, so the data scientists, and they'll be able to explain it uh, and keep pushing for that answer uh, to understand what you actually, what the, what are they actually promising you? Uh, it's very important that you do that because you don't want to be sold something that's uh, not doing uh, what it says it does. Um, okay, so I, I think what, what I said there is that we can detect simply, um, but I'm not making a broad statement here that says, you know, all signature detection is good and, you know, AI is not required. I'm, I'm certainly not saying that. There is a place for artificial intelligence uh, and there are bad signatures. So let's look at how we determine whether a signature is good or bad. Um, and this is where the threat intelligence example that I used earlier comes back into play here. Um, if, we, if we look at the, this is the pyramid of pain, which has been around for probably seven years or so, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and basically uh, there's a chap, uh, I forget his surname now, um, he, he's part of Sands, uh, it's part of Sands, and he's put, he put this together. And it, um, basically, he says that threat intelligence has um, different layers uh, and um, different levels of value. Um, so if we look at kind of hashes, like a file hash, um, that's not very great threat intelligence. It's at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, the reason is because an attacker can quickly change the hash value of a file, and then you are unable to detect it. So you can see where I'm going, where, I, where we can apply this to signatures. The same with an IP address. We know that attackers uh, move IP addresses all the time. As soon as you mark an IP address as bad, then they will get another IP address uh, that's not blocked. Um, so as we go up the, 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 the pyramid here, domain names, yeah, it's still pretty fairly easy to, to change. Um, and we start looking at artifacts, which is little bits of information left on, on machines. This is now getting uh, more difficult for an attacker to change. Um, and then if we start looking at tools, uh, you know, for an attacker to write a new tool is quite, a, is quite an undertaking. So uh, we don't, you know, if we can start detecting at that level, uh, then it becomes uh, more difficult for the attacker. So. If we look at that, those, those are fairly easy for us to detect with, with signatures as well. Um, so th that doesn't make them bad signatures, but they're not as valuable. Uh, so what we need to do is focus on writing signatures on the top here for the tools, for the tools that attackers are using and the TTPs. Now, this is taking a different approach to, to signatures because typically we are writing uh, signatures for, for you know, bits of code, and you know that's where AV focuses on, um, and that's really at the lower part of the pyramid. So we, you know they are there is still a use for them, but they're not as valuable as uh, they don't make it as difficult for attackers as if we're writing signatures for the top bit of the uh, of the of the pyramid. And can we write signatures for them? Most definitely we can, but we need to look at different telemetry. We need to look at different data to be able to to do that. So we can't look at the traditional forms of uh, data that we normally look at um, for, for the kind of legacy type of signatures. So, um, you know, what makes a good signature? Um, I think there's, uh, in, you know, I should emphasize again, I'm not saying all signatures are good. The bad ones are, are typically based on IOCs, like IP addresses, little bits of code uh, that, you know, finds malicious code inside an EXE. Um, you know, signatures can also require multiple type of events or trends, uh, and that kind of renders them less effective, but in many cases that's still required, but it's, it's, it's sort of like a scale. So 
if you look on the right here, uh, is if we can write a signature based on a single event that we um, of date, you know, if we have data and, and there's one single event in there, and we can recognize that event as uh, leading to malicious uh, activity, that's great. If we need to, uh, you know, analyze the data a bit, look at multiple type, multiple events, look at trends. Uh, it makes the signature less effective and, and more likely to create false positives and also to miss uh, miss true positives or to generate true uh, or to have true positives. Um, again, so you know, data. You know, if we have to manipulate the data, enrich it, and do other kinds of thing, it means the the signature becomes less effective. Uh, and so, really, what we want to do is write signatures that focus on the top of the pyramid, um, on the tools and the um, techniques that attackers are using. Uh, if we can write signatures for single based events uh, or single events, so you know we see one one event and that means malicious behavior. That's very solid way and, and less likely uh, to generate uh, false positives and, and to miss. And then obviously we need re we need reliable source data. Um, as soon as uh, we start manipulating data or adding um, other bits of information to the data, then uh, or, you know, to do not have a true source of the data, then uh, we start, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So we start messing with data that's not of high quality. Uh, then we have a, a likeliness of uh, having more uh, ineffective signatures. Um, so really, that's the, the crux of the presentation. If I look at um, some takeaways here, uh, you know, People are, are, are boxing signature detection in, in the bad box at the moment. And I, I really think that that's unfair to the concept of signature detection. Um, and, you know, signatures detection is not just for traditional AV. Um, uh, and although we, you know, as soon as someone says signature, we think antivirus signatures. Um, that's not necessarily the case. We can apply signatures to uh, behavior, to Kind of all types of things um, within an environment is provided we have the correct data. Uh, signatures need to be uh, focusing on the top of the, the pyramid of pain. Um, so if we can do that, then we can uh, make sure that they're very effective. Uh, we need the right data, so we need to think outside the box in terms of the data that we we typ typically look at for signatures. Um, and we can detect behavioral anomalies. You know, behavioral analysis is just looking at certain, it basically looks at a different data set that, that AV does, and um, it's working exactly the same way. There's no magic, um, there's no magic in there in behavioral uh, analysis, and analysis or behavioral detection. And yeah, we, you know, we, we keep with the concept, uh, keep it simple, you know, uh, and uh, certainly this signature detection is simple method of, of picking up malicious activity. The more simple our uh, defense systems are, uh, the more reliable they are. And it doesn't mean they have to, you know, simple does not equal ineffective. Um, and I, I, use, I use an example here. This uh, is a tweet from uh, a person named Florian Roth. Uh, and uh, this was from January this year. Uh, and basically, uh, someone was saying that this new piece of malware uh, was using a brand new method to bypass uh, UAC in Windows. Um, and basically what happened is, uh, this Florian guy, he writes a bunch of, uh, rules that are essentially signature based rules. Um, and he wrote a rule in 2017 that already picks up that exact same activity. So, you know, the vendors are saying this is brand new activity, you know, and, and he's saying here, well, you know, we've had this detection for, uh, you know, for three years now. So, uh, we don't need behavioral analysis. We can pick up this type of activity with a very simple signature-based rule. Um, and this is just an example of uh, some of the, the ways that we can use signature detection to, to pick up uh, malicious activity. And that's a wrap. I don't know if uh, we've had any questions uh, or comments. I kind of uh, sped through that uh, presentation quite quick. I hope I wasn't. Going, I hope I wasn't going too fast. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Um, 
I see Serge have joined us. Hi, Serge. How are you today? I was late. Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I not want anyone to notice, but thank you. <laughs> no, I lost maybe five minutes. Thanks a lot, Martin, for, for that. Uh, very, very interesting. And, and yes, which is, is not dead yet, but uh, we need to consider a new way to, to, to make detection. Um, some, you know, sometimes we, we think that uh, AI is more capable of uh, processing uh, a lot of data. Uh, and um, how, how is it for uh, traditional detection? I mean, is it, is it uh, also uh, okay to, to detect with a with lot of data or uh, yeah. what do you think? Uh, no, that's a good question, actually. And I think that, um, you know, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning is, is, is we have that capability because we know how to handle large amounts of data. Um, and the fact that we know how to handle large amounts of data and we have the systems in place to, to handle large amounts of data means that we can apply other things to it as well. And so absolutely, we can apply our, you know, our very uh, simplistic sim uh, signature-based detection to you know, massive amounts of data, and it works as well. And it's actually more efficient. So um, the fact that we can handle that amount of data, and we have big data engines that can can process so much data, um, you know, just uh, that help. That's an underlying um, kind of a capability that that allows us to do this. Uh, you know, with machine learning, with AI, with signatures, whatever the case might be. So. Um, that's, you know, that big data capability is not something that's specific to artificial intelligence. That's, for me, it's a layer underneath that just because we have the processing power and the storage capability to, to handle large amounts of data, we can apply it in, in multiple different ways. Okay. So we don't have many questions this morning. Serge, don't have something to to ask uh, Martin. I don't have any specific questions. I think we are quite in line with with Martin. I, I don't like that much talking about artificial intelligence because I, I think this is a thing we are we are not able to do now. Uh, it is uh, pretty clear on my side, uh, but for sure we learn, we hear. We hear more about um, machine learning, and even if if uh, uh, it seems to be complicated, uh, we are just taking data, putting that into databases, and then do some correlations uh, and um, and uh, analysis with this data. And uh, for 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 some vendors, uh, it works at some point. It depends what what you're looking for. But I agree with Martin when saying we need a combination of detection uh, tools, process, and, and analysis. Uh, and this is the point. Um, we don't have any uh, any solution uh, now working with our signature detection uh, only based on so-called AI or, or on machine learning. Uh, they all use uh, signature detection uh, as a standard uh, and then add a few features we don't have that much feedback about and still on the field uh, we need we need to, to to check how efficient it is uh, and if it's re really the, the machine learning or the or the ai uh, which is bringing uh, the value or not and this part is not clear for now yeah i i um I read an article probably about two months ago about um, the investment in, in artificial intelligence uh, within larger corporations uh, and that it's actually that they're actually tapering it down now uh, because of budget cuts. Um, and, you know, organizations are seeing it as a long term thing. And, and with uh, the pandemic 
uh, and kind of business slowing down for most organizations. Uh, they've decided that you know the return on on that investment may not be realized as quickly, and and money is, is spent better elsewhere. So, you know, I'm wondering if the hype cycle around the artificial intelligence, you know, if you look at the last 18 months, uh, people hiring, you know, data scientists uh, to help with with uh, artificial intelligence and, and helping organizations manipulate data and get uh, intelligence out of it um you know I'm, I'm wondering if that hype cycle isn't um is going to taper down uh over the coming uh, over the coming months um because people are asking the vendors the tough questions about you know what is this artificial intelligence it's been you know it's 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 had a, a period of time now to to showcase to customers and i think a lot was promised and i'm not sure if, if all the vendors can deliver on those promises so um again you know i'm i'm just wondering if it's it's painting a you know I, i'm very critical of artificial intelligence but i do think it ha it has its place uh and i think unfortunately that a lot of uh, what's happened is is kind of going to paint a bad name for artificial intelligence um because you know because of those promises that were made and and customers are not going to see the reality of those um and then they're going to have a bad taste in their mouth so I'm kind of fearful for that happening because, I, like I say, I, I do think that there is um, value in artificial intelligence, but uh, some of the stuff that was promised uh, is uh, is not realistic. And I think um, customers are, are going to realize that uh, eventually. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, they can obviously email us. Um, and yeah. we'd be happy to, to take up a discussion uh, offline. Okay, so I think uh, we'll stop here for today. Again, uh, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for having us. And uh, for everybody, we will uh, send you a link for the replay. And uh, also, the last three sessions are also available on uh, replay. So. Uh, feel free to ask if you haven't uh, uh, saw it yet. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, see you on the next session. Thank, thanks, thanks, Devon. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Okay. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, you too. Bye.